Uh, yeah, as Jennifer said, I'm Josh Weber. I'm, I'm a board member now with MIPA, and I've been with the hybrid publisher Calumet Editions now for four years. Also, in the same time, I've been running a radio show for the Minneapolis. It's a community radio station called KFAI. I run a program called Right on Radio. Actually, it's happening right now. It's kind of weird. I, I run it, and I just feel like a parent right now with my kids at home, just hoping they're Everything's going okay, but in the meantime, I think they'll be good. Um, so I've been doing that for four years, interview a lot of authors, and I think during the midst of the pandemic, I had an idea where I wasn't going to the studio as much, so I was trying to think of some way to market a lot of the authors we had with Calumet Editions and using what I knew of my background in radio to try to make a podcast around that. And so um, that is kind of where I began with that. Chris, are you out there? I'm here. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm good. So do you want to introduce yourself quick? Sure. I'm Chris Martin. I am a video producer, podcaster, all around nice guy, unless you ask my friend Michael, who's in the audience. Just kidding, Michael. Didn't mean to throw you on the spot. But uh, I'm uh, here to talk about podcasting with Josh. Yes. When did you start? When did you first start your podcast? Uh, July of 2016. 16. Why did you start it out? Uh, I had a student at the time I was teaching a class at a community college and a student said that she liked actually what I was teaching the class. And so she was like, I wish you had kind of a medium outside of the classroom to share your knowledge and wisdom. And uh, those are her words, not mine. And uh, so I don't really listen to podcasts. I definitely didn't listen to them then. And I had a friend of mine who had a podcast and he kind of recommended I should do one. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. So one thing why it would really convince me to want to go over to podcasts, I came over a statistic about how there are something like 600 million blogs that are out there right now and 23 million YouTube channels, but only maybe this number has risen, but it's something like 800,000 podcasts. Now these numbers, these figures are still big, but I mean, with a podcast in comparison to these other parts of it, I mean, it's something like for every podcast, there are 750 blogs and 29 YouTube channels. So if you're okay, well, that's good. So we have this piece right here that is engaging a different for an audience in a long form content, using it in places where maybe they couldn't do it before they could do it while they're, yeah, please feel free to post questions as well. I mean, I <laughs> would appreciate it. So that's where that began for me. And I am currently now, I think about four four episodes into it. And you were telling me yesterday, so you've done how many episodes, Chris? 563, I think. Yes, 563, 325 of those are monologues and 234 are interviews. So, so how did you initially develop, how did you develop your format for the first episode? Did you do multiple sessions, different takes? How did you decide how you want your episode to be structured? Uh, I wrote it. And then I was more focused on how am I actually going to deliver this? Cause I hated the sound of my own voice. Uh, like a lot of people that I talk to about podcasts, they're like, oh, I hate the sound of my own voice. I was right there at the beginning too. So I, I just kind of explored the idea of an introduction, a main content section, and then kind of an outro. That's one thing I know I wasn't initially, I've had ideas in the past about how what I learned is a lot of authors, I mean, if you're not curious enough to want to figure out how this works, we'll get more into the more of the nuts and bolts of how to make a podcast a little bit later. Right now, we're just focusing more on content, on building a, a podcast around a topic of interest that you want to do. But in the meantime, we'll just focus on this in case you're wondering how this is going to go. But I was kind of, I wanted authors initially to do something kind of fun where they could maybe build some kind of, some kind of short stories or some fiction that could build into a podcast, which is a really fun idea. And there's a lot of people out there. I mean, Welcome to Nightville is a very interesting idea where it's a fictitious, um, like, I don't, I don't know. Are you familiar with Welcome to Nightville? Mm -mm. Okay. Welcome to Nightville. It's, um, think of it, if it's like Twin Peaks or the X-Files, but like there's a news broadcaster in the town kind of reporting on different things happening around them. And that gave me an idea of how to do, it'd be fun to have some of our authors do content like that built around maybe their own works. And the only way to get that would be to have um, uh, some kind of podcast or show that reach out to it. And that way they'd be knowing more. It would be a way to expose them to their work and to their books. I thought it was a good marketing tool. That's my first idea of how I got that. But I realized a lot of authors, they like the idea, but the execution is always a hard part of that. So I was like, okay, 
what I knew they could do though was talk about their work. They could talk about themselves, their background. And so that's where I thought, okay, I can do something that's narrative based. I can do a talk show though. I can build something around that. So I had enough skills where I could do, where I could build my, my audience around me just speaking to people about what they knew about the writing, their characters, and the process of making a book. Did you, how did it evolve for you? Was it like that over time? Did you, how did you discover that for yourself? I knew that I could talk for about 10 minutes on a subject. I, I was hesitant to do anything more than that. Cause then you're like, how am I actually going to sustain this amount of content over a period of time? So I kind of picked a, a release schedule of doing something weekly so that I could find that rhythm and then I think it was probably a few months in where I'm like, I, I need to add something else to the mix. I need to add some interviews into the mix because uh, I, I was afraid in the beginning that I would actually run out of stuff to say. Mm -hmm. So then I just started asking friends to be on the show. Uh, the, first, <laughs> the first interview was actually, I think, episode 12. And it was a, a friend who was a filmmaker down in Hollywood. And I thought it was a safe bet to, to interview him. Let's talk about a little bit about length then. So how long do your interviews usually go for? So the interviews, I tend to be around 45 to an hour. Do you tell your, your guests ahead of time that's who you'd want to be? Or do you determine that usually just based off the flow of the conversation? It's mainly just based upon the schedule. So when they schedule the interview, it, it just schedules them for an hour okay. time block. And so I let them know in that tool that I use that that's the maximum commitment, but then there are the occasional people that will like to keep going. And so I think the, the most that I've actually done is an hour and a half. I don't think I've gone on to two hours or three hours. That's a lot of effort. <laughs> the longest, I didn't actually do it for the episode I uploaded, but I had a conversation between two authors. That's one thing I'd like to do as well, besides just having me talk all the time. I think that'd be boring just to have one person, but trying to have a diverse pool of different people coming on. So I had two authors, one who um, was a book called Mozart in Prague by Daniel Freeman. He's a musicologist. And it was a conversation with him. And then another author we, Rod, we have as well, Roderick Phipps Kettlewell. And they talked about their subject. And initially I planned for it to be about 25 to 30 minutes, but it went to being close to an hour. But it was good. It gave me a lot of ample material to work with. So then afterwards, I just had to cut the pieces I want that I thought worked well. So that was really interesting. But the one downside to that time, though, is that Daniel was a very quiet person. So how much? Um, so Daniel was a very quiet individual. So it was hard. I, I feel like as a person in the in the, the spot, I was trying to, to mediate between the two of them. It was hard for me to try to draw him out. So when I was in the editing, at the editing table, I tried to be more generous with him, but try to break out the piece of it. it sound like he was also sharing the load in the conversation, too. Yeah, it's, it's awesome when you have two people and then you're kind of the mediator between the two, mm. uh, especially some of the most enjoyable conversations from the host perspective. I had two filmmakers who were colleagues and friends for probably 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so that was such an enjoyable conversation because then you know, like I just have to like dangle a little carrot or something on a string and then they just go for like 20 minutes on the topic and I just sit back and enjoy it and then right. fuel the fire when it starts to die down. Exactly. <laughs> Kelly is asking, how much editing do you do after the conversation? Really depends for myself. Um, okay, good example. I just did an um right there. So those pauses, I spent a lot of time going through when I started out, it would take me maybe, uh, I was really obsessive about really going to the fine minutia of all those points of it. I would maybe spend two hours going through the first time. Now I can get down to maybe about 45 minutes to be really, really careful about it. I don't know, Chris, what about you? You know, for me, it, it kind of depends on the level of time and commitment that I want to make to the particular episode. Uh, it, it depends on how much time I have to, like if it's due tomorrow, I'm not going to edit it as tightly as maybe I would have in the beginning. And I'm a lot looser of an editor now because I just let people be themselves. Uh, and I had, a, I had a boss at one point on this journey who's like, I can hear your edits. And so <laughs> that on I... one hand, that was like, 
you know, I actually made a sticker for my business out of that because I'm just like, that's a good marketing line, <laughs> you know, but that's also my way of being, you know, like anti what he was telling me. So I just developed rules over, uh, it. so let's say the word, um, for example, Josh, if, if I, sometimes an, um, will go into another word, like, um, maybe. And so I would actually try to like cut between where the um ends and the maybe begins and get rid of the um and then fade in the M on the maybe. Yep. And so you can actually hear a lot of times, especially in the middle, because I would try to like string words together and, and do all that. So you could actually sometimes hear clicks and, and sounds. Um, whereas now I'm just like, if I have a clean edit, which means space, um, space, I'm just going to cut that out and leave the space. It's I know exactly what you're talking about. I just edited an episode. It's pre-recorded for an interview that's playing tonight on Radio Radio, and it was there's points where he'd be in the conversation, and I could. Real. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> Um, no, I think everyone everyone should be muted except for our speakers. I don't know what that was, but everyone just make sure you're muted. Okay. Yeah, so I was doing a, an interview yesterday. Or I did an interview on Friday, and then I was going through ads like you're talking about. There's many points, though, where poltergeist, probably. I... <laughs> Where, like you're saying for like where an um is enmeshed in the in the verbiage of what they're talking about so you have to clean it out but like you can hear it though if you're very tuned in and can listen to it you can hear where that gap goes into it so it's very if you're really good at it, i mean you can make it not so obvious but if you know it i know i know myself i recognize when i hear it now so mm -hmm. i've kind of loosened up too i realized that with myself if the person has ums and breaks in it it's it's, I don't want to say it's like cutting away who they are. I mean, I kind of want to make them sound as cogent as I can for them, but I've loosened my hold on trying to be perfect yeah. on when these episodes go out. That's one thing I've learned to do. It's not good for anyone to be beating your head over a small little, one thing that really gets me and um, it's little ticks or like if I'm talking to someone over Zoom and I'll hear like a ding or a, a notification, I hear that and I'll try to cut that out and it really just er, it irks me. I've learned that just it's life. It happens, if especially in like a midst of like a really juicy bit. Someone's talking about something really good, and you're like a bing. It can be like, oh my god, we're there, and then it just takes you out of the moment. So, yeah, things like that. I definitely have gone through many times over. Yeah, or the or the noisy cable scratching on a beard, like mm. the, the and it creates just this crinkling noise. <laughs> I, I, and I and I think Josh, you bring up a really interesting point though. Because there is that tendency when you're starting your show to be like, everything has to be perfect. If the show's not perfect, people aren't going to listen. They aren't going to come back. But you aren't going to be perfect, you know, and you're going to find your way through time. Mm -hmm. So give yourself a break in, in the, the editing room and in the, the expectations of perfection. Because you're going to say, you're going to discover your favorite word through the process of podcasting yeah whether it's so or like or um there's going to be a filler word there well even for me i know it when people have like a like they use as a, like it's like this and then i was like i know for myself i say kind of a lot and i do not like that at all one thing it makes you very very um attentive to your you're very very self-conscious i think doing this stuff for me i um i noticed with myself i talk very fast and I've been told this many times, so I deliberately have to make to slow myself down while I'm talking to fully enunciate every word that's coming out so you can definitely hear what I'm saying. It's these little, I mean, it makes you good, I think, a better conversationalist overall when you're doing it, but these little things you become more aware of when you're doing these pieces. Michael Lamb, he asked, do they archive their podcast for later access? And if so, where are the topics listed for selection? Chris, can you speak to that? So typically with like a podcast in terms of the technical components, uh, you can listen to podcasts on like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Podbean, all these different apps. Um, I don't, there are so many, I don't, I don't know all of them, 
but then there's often a website associated with a podcast. So for my own podcast, because there's certain size limitations to what, what's called an RSS feed, uh, if the RSS feed doesn't have a certain responsiveness in terms of how fast it takes to download, Apple will actually like pause your show. Like they'll pause the updating on the back end. And so I limited my RSS feed to 75 episodes, which means there's almost 500 archives on the website itself. So that was something that I didn't know at the beginning going into it. And so it was just something that I discovered over time. I don't think I've ever really explored this enough, but is there a way to have to categorize your listing for what your episodes go into if you want to have it be focused in on a certain topic for the people you're speaking with? Okay, really? Yeah. So it, on the back end, in terms of like WordPress, so I use WordPress for the website, you can sp specify tags and categories and, and things like that. I haven't gone to the extent of tagging everything because uh, that would be a lot of effort on my end to listen to a show, generate all the tags. Uh, if I would have had that foresight at the beginning, I would have worked it into the process and it would have just been part of the process. But at, you kind of get stuck in your ways. <laughs> and mm. so it, it becomes more difficult to change the process over time. I definitely relate to that. Chris, what is your website? Uh, the podcast website is gettingworktowork.com and the short URL is gwtw.co. And I'll go you want, to, yeah, I'll I was say maybe just add a link into the chat. Yeah, there you go. Beautiful. One thing I was going to bring up, or we were talking before about how to present ourselves in the midst of an interview. One thing I, I it's a, it's a habit that I have with, I think with any zoom call and I, I do, especially you definitely can relate to this probably is when I'm interviewing someone, I'm usually looking at the sound quality as I'm watching, like I'm, I'm trying to do like a lot of things simultaneously. I'm watching how they're speaking. I'm watching how the sound's coming through. Plus I'm thinking about what I'm going to be saying ahead, looking at my notes, all that stuff is kind of happening at once. Is that a bit like that for you as well? Mm -hmm. Is it hard for yeah. you to focus? Well, I purposely don't do video-based interviews very often because I can get distracted by the chat. I can I can get distracted trying to read mm -hmm. the other person. And so I chose at the beginning to do audio-only interviews. Um, and that was a point of hesitation as well because I have a documentary production background. So I was used to sitting in the same room with someone making eye contact, trying to draw out their story. And I didn't know how I was going to do that over the internet. Cause you know, in 2016, I think Zoom was around, but Skype was more of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the tools were a little bit more limited on what was possible. And I, I just didn't know if I could do it. I, I was very hesitant to even try mm -hmm. uh, until I just realized why not try? Why not? Why not? I mean, uh, that, yeah, I mean, with your point though, audio only was so that I could focus. Yeah. I definitely see the, the value behind that now. I mean, that's one thing I've had that's really helpful. I think in a, in a studio, at least I'm not thinking about looking at myself right now while I'm also talking. It's yeah. Layers of like introspection and, and self-analysis go into that. that I don't really need while I'm trying to talk to someone about doing something like doing a podcast. Do you record audio over Zoom? Is the quality always good enough? Um, I haven't had a whole lot of issues with this. I know. So the interviews I've had with the authors that I've done so far, I just, with Zoom, you can record and then you have a sound file. That's something we should talk about really quickly. So one thing I've, when you download, we do an interview with Zoom, the audio that comes from it, you, I, I have to go through an audio conversion to make an MP3 or a WAV file. That's something you have to do the same thing as well. Yep. Yep. So I had to do that. And then that's when I can actually play with it and usually uh, do my edits on it. And I usually, I use my, mine in Camtasia and that's where I add my piece that I'm gonna, the recording. And then I had my intro, my outro pieces and my own recordings I do to introduce the episode or some pieces I wanna add in there for a note or for, um, for a preview of episode coming up. I haven't had any too many issues with that though. It seems you can always adjust the volume and you can take out any, there's, there's tools you can use for noise reduction as well in that clip you have though. Is that your experience, Chris? You know, I, I find that Zoom has 
a horrible audio quality compared to the the tools that I use. I use a tool called Zencaster, which will record uh, wave files right in the browser. And I can I'll, I I can hear a difference, but I, I don't think a lot of people hear the difference. Where you hear the difference is if someone doesn't have a microphone. If they're just using like the mic on their computer, then you start hearing Zoom making the audio sound glorious is what I'll sarcastically say. But that's a level that I had to do. I just, I've trained myself to hear that over time. So I, I can hear it. And so I can hear when people are recording on Zoom. Mm -hmm. If I listen to a show, I can, oh, that's Zoom compression right there. <laughs> I know I use, I think a wave file before, but when usually when I've done recordings, it's not always at home and I've had to upload to a Google drive or something. And for me, I don't think the, the sound quality people don't pick up on it as much. So just for simplicity and just for, because it's wave files are, they're heavy. They're they they take up a lot of data. So just uh, for simplicity's sake, I usually do an MP3 version of it. And that doesn't have too many issues. Um, just, just for like this file size commitment, an hour long interview and per guest is about 600 megabytes of information. So it can be around 300 megabytes per person. Yeah, it's not light. Whereas Zoom, you, you might get 60 megabytes per person. One thing I wanted to ask you is, I mean, you the volume of episodes you've had now, what, 234 interviews I think you've done? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do you go for recruiting to find people to talk to for your podcast? So in, in the beginning, it was just reaching out to people and, and just saying, hey, I've got a podcast. Would you like to be on it? And so I've, I generated like a, a, an outreach email and I create, I use a tool called text expander so that I can just type my shortcut for the email right in Google apps and it will spit out the email and I can just change the pertinent information so that I don't have to type 75% of the email okay. over and over and over again. Uh, I get a lot of pitches now. Uh, for um, PR agencies. So I would say that, I would say 60% of my interviews now come from PR agencies and 40 comes from me putting the word out okay. with people. Uh, it, and it ebbs and flows based upon the season. So like right now, like I'm getting a lot of pitches. Like there's, there's just all of these pitches coming in. And so I just kind of look at, do I want to talk to this person? Yeah, this book sounds like it could be interesting, but is it good? And then other times, like I'll listen to a, a, a good podcast that I listen to is called Marketing Mentor by someone uh, by a woman named Elise Bennon. And she's got a great interviewing style. And I actually heard this, this one guy sharing his wisdom and insight. Uh, he's actually on the call right now. And I, and we ended up having several conversations on the podcast because he's such a uh, outgoing person. And like, he called my phone number and, and we mm. ended up having a conversation. So it's like, it could be anything, but it's just like being open to being curious uh, and, and talking to pretty much anyone you want to talk to and trying to talk to anyone. Uh, one of the things that I often tell people is make three lists. List A is all of the people that uh, you know you would get an immediate yes from. Mm -hmm. So that when you're in a bind, you'd be like, I know I can get this person to talk and so I can meet my schedule. Yeah. List B is, you know what? I really want to talk to these people. I'm pretty sure I could make it happen. And if it happens, that would be amazing. And then list C are the heroes. Like the people that are like, if they said yes, like I, I would just, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I'm going to lose sleep and obsess over the questions more than I would. So uh, you're a professional. So I imagine, you know, how to really go into an interview without really a whole lot of prep, but do you, do you still prepare ahead of time? Do you have a lot of questions in mind of what you want to ask them or do you know you do? I, I spend, I try to spend a lot of time on each guest. I have the same opening question. And then I have the same closing questions. 
Uh, and then everything else, you know, I'll, I'll have a suggested list of things that I want to talk about and I'll share those questions with, with the interview subject. But then based upon how the interview kicks off, like we might get into the middle of the interview based upon what they respond with. And so I, I just let them be themselves and I follow along and guide the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you read books? Yeah. So Holly Jorkson's asking, do you read the books before interviewing the authors? I do a very deep dive into every person I interview. It's, I, it's maybe to my own detriment. I will spend a lot of time going over their work. I, I'll, I'll make notations. I'll do stuff in the margins. If I have a book of it, I'll build it and compile it all to a bunch of questions. I don't really ask everything, but I definitely read everything for the interview ahead of time. I actually, I'm really kind of, uh, kind of a stalker. I'll eventually go on social media. I'll find like <laughs> old posts of theirs. I'll bring it up to make, to, to add levity to the piece. And I was like, Oh, I said that to make them to catch them off guard a little bit. But yeah, I do a very extensive background for everyone. I usually interview for the shows and for the, my authors as well, whenever for author view, I, yep. Yeah, I've read all the, well, I, I'll publish the books, but I, it's, definitely helpful i think they and people recognize it too if you've read the book or not you know um when you ask a little more um specific questions about a, a character or their motivation or something they'll recognize it i've seen that they usually i've gotten reception from the authors saying that they could definitely tell i've read the work so getting that feedback from them i've been consistent and always trying to read the stuff ahead of time i i try it's not always realistic for me to read everyone's book sometimes the book is just awful uh sorry um and and i just don't get into it but they're still an interesting person and so uh if i don't connect with the book i might just literally draw out the person instead of the book um so it just kind of depends on on where i'm at with my schedule sometimes pr people will send me prepared questions uh, and that helps and springboard my imagination of what I would actually want to know. Mm -hmm. And so I, tr I try to use whatever tool is at my disposal, but then there's those moments, those glorious moments where, just like you're saying, Joshua, where you've read the book, they know you've read the book, they're opening themselves up in a way because you've done your homework. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it doesn't have to be every episode though for me, but I try. The one thing I'll say, I've had definitely interviews where a publicist has reached out to me and I've read the book and then I realize this is awful. Even then though, I still think there's something worth talking about though. Like I still think that's more interesting to find why I don't like this book. And I'll, in a very, uh, maybe kind of a, in a meanwhile, I'll find a way to kind of ask some questions like, why did you do this in this way? And why, I don't care for this that much. Can you respond to and tell me why you did this? And oftentimes- the interview still can be very interesting. So yeah. I, I think there's something always to salvage even from a, a bad incident. And that's, I think to me still makes it worthwhile to read a book like that. Right. And I, I think you bring up a really interesting point too, is like, you can't always trust the moment of whether an interview or an episode is good or not. So like there's, there's been moments where I'll be in an interview and like, this is the worst interview in the world. I cannot connect with this person. I hated every question that I asked. It was crap, you know, and you start playing that. And then I'll get back in the editing a week, two weeks, a month later and be like, oh, that was a good interview. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. All right, we have a question here. So Alfred K is asking, I've heard that today people more often watch and hear a story on video rather than read. Reading involves more effort. So if an author narrates a story on audio podcast, would that expedite the sales of his novels? Truthfully, I'm not quite sure to be honest about that. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean, do you, Chris, do you, I mean, when you do your podcast, is it monetized in any way? I mean, how do you roll that into it? No, no, it's not. And, okay. and the interesting, so here, here's the interesting thing that I've, I've really wrestled with in the early days. I'm like, if I get someone famous on the show, I'm going to get a lot of downloads. And, and that was wrong in so many ways because it's not only the name doesn't draw people to the show sharing draws people to the show mm -hmm. so the people who shared the episode 
typically saw a spike in downloads. But I, I don't honestly know how many people have bought something because of hearing about it on the show. Sure. I'd like to believe in my imagination that a lot of that's happening, that the conversion rate is amazing, but it's probably further from the reality. Yeah. I wouldn't rely on narrating their story on audio to get it across. I'd use it more like how, like a marketing tool as well, to maybe to showcase or talk about the work to sell the book. But I think to actually narrate that piece of the story to try to sell stuff, I don't really know about that. I don't think that's really helpful in trying to expedite sales. How do you develop an audience and how it can be maintained? That's a really good question. Um, Chris, well, you have a really interesting thing. So you've you have built a whole base of listeners, I think. And you also, I think the way you did it though, is you have curiosity builders that that's a, it's a group of people you bring together to talk about your episodes or their well, that own. That was after the fact. That was after the fact though, but that happened yeah. after time though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So building an audience is very challenging because the first thing that, that I can, that I try to get people to understand is like, who are you even talking to? Like, who, who do you want your audience to be? Because if you think that it's going to be everyone, it's, it's not. Uh, so in the beginning, your audience is your friends and your family. I mean, I'll get, I'll get emails from my mom saying, oh, I like what you talked about today. Or, you know, like, I didn't see you sharing on social media. Are you still doing your podcast? And so it's like, yes, mom. But, it, it, but it, you know, it, it grows from, for me, just making one-on-one -on -one connections. And, and talking to people and sharing it and having people share it. Um, I, I kind of take the long way around. Well, the network angle is a big part of it. I've been very aggressive when I first had run a radio too. I had access to a bunch of, to my face, to all my friends on Facebook. I sent them invitations to like that. And from that got people to like it. And from them, people saw that liked it. It organically built a following around that. That takes time though. It's not gonna happen overnight. That could take years to really get more attention around that. So that's the real recommendation I get for you. And just, just having content out there initially just in the first place and then having that to share with people will help you build that audience. But it definitely is an aggressive attempt to try to get attention. It's a very hard thing to do. It is hard. And, yeah. and I think too, when when you're starting out you are the audience because you don't actually have one yet <laughs> so you're like am i even enjoying this myself like mm -hmm. it, do i think there's something here and yeah there's a little bit of ego in that saying yes absolutely and then uh through the first probably 250 episodes a good friend of mine listened to every single episode and he would send notes after he listened to it and he would be like, I can hear you reading again, stop it. And, I, and so it's just like, you know, that kind of helped me to refine the presentation side. And then that helped to get more comfortable and build that process and, and schedule of getting things out. Because part of, part of building that audience is, I'm going to commit to releasing an episode every week. Mm -hmm. You pick a day, and you show up on that day and it's there and, and people know it's going to be there. Um, so for me, I release two episodes a week, Wednesdays and Fridays, and people know that there's going to be episodes on Wednesdays and Fridays. So that way they have something to look forward to. You build a pattern. I get that. Yeah. yeah. Kelly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she asked, would you recommend authors start their own po podcast or see podcasts be guests on? How do you find those podcasts? What's the best way to reach out? That's a really good question. So again, two things. Um, I had the experience. So when I first came on board with Kelly and Matt, I was involved in a lot of blog content with author authors. We had a place where we could help them establish their own blog and we, we encourage them to write each week. And we have a huge Twitter following that we can share with people. And that way it could potentially lead people to recognize them and maybe sell books. Problem is though, like you're saying though, is this idea of consistency, having a pattern to constantly do it though. People are people, they fell off they weren't really committed to doing it. So it didn't happen as much. So you, we built this whole infrastructure of authors doing this and never fall through on that. So I was discouraged by doing it. Authors, I can't help them to want to do that for themselves. So I didn't really do it. And so if the, if the author has a skill set and the interest to do it, and they're very charismatic. They know how to talk to people. I would definitely say, absolutely go for it. But if not, it, I, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of a dead end. 
What do you think, Chris? I would say start with going on other people's shows to see if you even like it. But I would also recognize that not everyone is going to interview you the way that you would want to be interviewed. So I, I have a friend who I reached out to her to be on the show. She had a good experience. And then a couple of weeks ago, she actually sent me a message saying, I just had the worst podcasting experience where we didn't even get through the whole interview. She goes, if I would, if this was my first experience, I, I, I would have given up on wanting to be on other people's shows. And so just kind of recognizing that you're going to have a different experience with every single person who interviews you. Um, and don't, don't judge the experience on the first or the last experience. Yeah, no kidding. Can an author pursue his career of writing novels with the idea that people love to read or hear engrossing stories? Oh, that's a good question. I don't really know how to answer that. People love to hear. Alfred, can you expand on that question a little bit? Yeah. How do you define okay, there. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I've very much want to build a career on writing novels. And many people say, well, only a fortunate few can can really succeed at that, like John Grisham and J.K. Rowling and uh, Stephen King, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I don't think that's quite true. I think if you learn, if you learn how to build real engrossing stories, uh, that might not be the case. Um, I think that since the uh, beginning of time, people have just loved to listen or hear stories that are that really grasp them. Okay, okay so it's it's a very um, uh, uh, problematical thing. It's it's a very uncertain thing, but it's worth taking the risk. I think. Okay, so how would you respond to that? I think that if you think starting out that you're going to be like a J John Grisham or, you know, a Stephen King, you know, I, I think just getting your stories out in any form is the best way to start. And a podcast is a great way to do that in terms if it doesn't, a podcast doesn't need to be nonfiction. There's a lot of fiction based podcasts that are basically audio dramas. So find the best way that you actually enjoy telling stories and bring those to the mediums that you want to enjoy working in. That's if you like it enough, I imagine there's going to be an audience who's going to like it as well. I wouldn't try yeah. to find like a very, a certain niche to get in just because you know, a certain brand of people like it. I, mm -hmm. I definitely would encourage you to try to do what you think is going to be the most. What do you find engrossing? I think there's going to be people who are going to like it as well. That's, yeah. that'd be my, that'd be my take. How do you define or cater your audience that, well, the big thing for me when I was doing my started author view is I figured it'd be people who are interested in the publishing. And I knew from not a lot of people are familiar with the idea of hybrid publishing is this joint venture model for, for publishing that I think there's maybe kind of a, a slant against people don't know enough about. So I thought it would be interesting to talk to authors who've gone through the experience with me who are involved in that process with them. I thought it'd be a great way to talk about the business and also them, themselves and the book. I thought it was a great way to do that. How did you define your audience, Chris? I just started with my friends, the people that were in kind of the same boat as me. So being creative entrepreneurs, being people who worked for themselves, freelancers, people who wanted to live a more creative life. And I just started to think about what, what can I share about my journey that could help other people? 
what what could I share that might help them to not make the same mistakes that I've made or enjoy the mistakes they've made more? <laughs> and so I just, you know, I built this long list of just things that I knew I could talk about that would satisfy those people, but also allow me to remember some of those moments in the past that I don't remember sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and fortunately, I get the benefit of repeating myself often, most likely. So, uh, Mr. Nylander is asking, is a short term limited run podcast make any sense? Some of the big players do this, but it seems like a lot of marketing effort. Um, I think to actually build an audience, it takes a long time to do it in the first place. So I'd recommend if you're going to do it, commit to having to do it for the long term. That's something I plan to do for a while. And I think as I do each episode, I'll probably improve over time. I think if you have a, if you are a, the name around what you're going to make a podcast, podcast like your John Grisham, for example, I think that kind of sells itself. But if you're starting out like Chris, I imagine you, no one knows who you are. No one knows what kind of value you're going to have with your show. It's going to take a long time to prove that. So I would say it makes more sense to go for a longer stretch of it, not just do a short term, unless I, I don't know, Chris, you have any thoughts? When I'm usually advising people who want to build a podcast, I usually present two different approaches. One is kind of the infinite podcast, which like my show, it's an infinite run. There's no end in sight. Uh, it, it's just one of those things where it's just going to keep going until I decide I'm done. Mm -hmm. But that's a hard thing to sell to someone. It, it, as, a, as a podcast producer for other people, no one's really bought in that one. <laughs> they, they haven't <laughs> bought in that package. But the package they buy is like, okay, what if you approached a 12 episode season mm -hmm. where you release four episodes a month for three months, and then we reevaluate the direction you want to go, whether you want to do it again, and then we can work together on season two. Mm -hmm. And so it helps with budgeting. It helps with seeing how it fits into their business. It helps them to see how they're actually going to grow from it without just kind of like get, w wishing for something to work out, which was, you know, kind of my business plan at, at the beginning with, with getting work to work. Like it didn't connect to my business at all. Whereas now I get a lot of business from it. Yeah. How can you find podcasts for authors? I have actually some, some good anecdotal experience with this. So um, I published an author, his name is Martin Keller for his book, The Space Pen Club. There's a lot of his, his contact and his research and um, unexplained aerial phenomena and UFOs. And so the one thing I thought right out of the bat was he needs to be on podcasts. I, I'm sure there is, that's, I mean, a very specific uh, grouping of people I knew and podcasts out there talking about that subject. So the first thing I did right out of the bat was go to Spotify and I studied in UFOs and there's a listing of podcasts for that. And that worked beautifully. And I found so many listings from there. And then just from there, um, I'd recommend recommendations of other shows to check out. And from that, I just used that, looked on Google and that just kind of spiraled from there. And then actually finding establishing contact though, that was, um, it wasn't that hard. I mean, usually if lucky enough, they maybe have a website and from there they have like an info email, you can reach out to them and then they can respond in a couple of days. Sometimes they may just have a Facebook page from there. They have an email you can link them to or a person reach out. I know I reached out to someone through a Facebook messenger. And from there, I was able to connect with someone who ran the podcast and that I was able to schedule time for my author to go on the show. I got about five or six interviews from just doing that. That was a really simple, easy process. But then again, not every author is going to have something as easy as something like talking about aliens, UFOs, and conspiracy <laughs> theories. So that was a very easy thing for me to do, though. So not, you're not always going to have that experience like I did. Chris, um, is that, that's pretty, that's what I would recommend. What would you suggest? I, I would say find just search for podcasts and put like in the search box authors or books or maybe the genre that you're writing in or interested in. Uh, Podmatch is also a great place to start. I put the link in the chat because it allows you to sign up as someone who wants to be on shows or if you're seeking guests to be on your show. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's a way to, to get people who are looking for guests. And yeah. so you can specify where you're looking to speak from, whether it's like books or literary subjects or things like that. Definitely. Um, blah, blah, blah. 
I think it's Kelly here is asking I 30 plus video interviews I've done. Could I turn the audio into a podcast? Absolutely. That's something I think you should definitely do. Um, it depends if you have the audio from those interviews, you could convert it like I was talking about before. You can do, I mean, if it's through Zoom, for example, you'd have to do it. You have to convert it to either an MP3 or a WAV file. And from there, once you know what you, you've staged, what you want to have for a podcast, you could just upload that audio file. So that's definitely something I recommend doing. Very fast, easy way to have content to build for a podcast. But I, I, I guess I would, I would think though too, what you want your podcast to be about, like what kind of content is it for and mold that content around it. So it's not just blah, just random stuff you're talking about. That's a better way to market it and sell it. <laughs> Talk to think that's a perfect name for a podcast. Talk to think. I know a lot of verbal processors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, well, I'm certainly... I like to listen. So it's like, great for them. I can definitely tell you're a very good listener, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I can definitely tell you're a very good listener, which makes you an exceptional person to do a podcast. <laughs> Sorry, I was cracking a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, well, one thing I, I kind of want to touch on maybe is some people out there interested in more of the technical details. Um, so for recording your episodes, you said you work, you use Adobe Audition. So I, I actually made some notes on the different tools that I use, if that's helpful from the production aspect, the publishing aspect, and then the promotion aspect. So in, in terms of production, you know, I'm recording in Adobe Audition with my microphone and in audition, I, I also, I do the recording of the monologues and then kind of the intros and outros for the interviews. Okay. So every episode kind of has like a kickoff. So right now I'm, I'm editing tomorrow's interview and I'm just, I just make notes as I'm editing it so that I then write the description that will go on the website, which will then sync with the podcast app. Yeah. So just, just things like, you know, my friend said, how do we get here and why are things the way they are? That, that fuels this curiosity. And mm -hmm. so I just, I kind of get that thing, that those thoughts going. And then I write my notes in, a, in an app called IA Writer. And then I use Grammarly to make sure I sound good. And then I make all the artwork in Photoshop. So in, in terms of the production aspect of the, of the episode itself, I export to an MP3 file. So most podcasting platforms require either an MP3 or an M4A file. Yep. They generally I, don't want a, a WAV file. But yeah. WAV files for an, a WAV file is an uncompressed audio file, whereas an MP3 file is a compressed file, meaning it's a lot smaller. Yeah. Makes it easier to transfer, though, to give to people. That's only. Yes. Yeah. If you're, say your quality, though, I definitely recommend not doing that. Um, so what I use is, um, what I typically use right now, Camtasia was one, it's meant for, I think, most for videos, but I know you could also incorporate other assets into it, which is what I really like about that, where I can do, I can have a, like a, a sample of some audio that I have for my intro and outro. I can add that into it, and then I can also do a recording in there as well, and then add that to it and can play around and edit in the meantime and splice in what uh, time signatures I want to have them go into. So that's one thing I use quite a bit. Otherwise, a very cheap, easy way if you want to edit the actual audio is Audacity. I know it's a very free version. That's where I picked up. And if you're starting out and not sure if you like it or just kind of get out an idea of how it operates, how it works, how to cut something, how to move a file, Audacity is an easy way to do it. Otherwise, um, I was very fortunate at the studio, I use Hindenburg. That's a little more complicated though, and it's a bit more expensive, I think. So that's where sounds I sounds expensive. Hindenburg, it's a yeah, I, it's meant mostly, I think, <laughs> for like audio journalists. So that's through a subscription there. So I'm I went from that to Audacity. It was like a step down, down to <laughs> being a living in, like in, in luxury and then coming down to being a popper. So but it, it works well. It gets <laughs> it, it gets a job done. So that's where I liked it. So that's both places I'd recommend for using your uh, recordings. Now, I'm just going to interject one solution that's really gaining popularity in podcasts and video work as well is Descript. And what Descript allows you to do is to take an audio file, it will transcribe it into a, a, you know, a written form, 
And then you can edit the audio file by editing the transcript. That's really cool. Whoa. Like it blows my mind. Like my workflow is established to where I, I just, I can't even wrap my mind around that, but people swear by it. <laughs> so I've, I've learned to read the waveform, but I mean, if you're starting out, try to script. Um, there's, there's free all the way up to paid, uh, pl uh, pricing plans. So try it mm -hmm. out. If you like it, it might just save you a lot of time. You know, something I was, when we were talking yesterday, I was, I was curious. So you have a logo for it right now. You have a little, of the Frankenstein figure is it, it's an illustration of yourself. Is that, am I right? It's you as yeah, Frankenstein. It, it was based on Frankenstein in, in terms of, I think there's like a Terminator reference in there too. Uh, I think I, my pitch to my friend, who's the illustrator was, I just said, mad scientist. And that's what he came back with. The reason I'm bringing this up is because um, when I, I came up with a logo for right on radio and the show has been around for a long time, but a lot of places that I looked into recommend holding off on actually building a logo before. Yes. In all its glory. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, that's one thing I was going to mention that I'm going to probably hold off maybe until the, the new year to actually get a logo. I have right now is just the our company logo, Calumet Editions for, so people recognize what it's for, but to actually something more formal like what you have right now. Did you wait a while before you actually got that? Uh, no, I, I, made the <laughs> I made the logo right out of the gate. I mean, it's Dang. like, you know, because... You know, I made merch and coasters and stickers and buttons. And uh, for me, it was an, a, a, cr a crucial part of the journey. So like initially my podcast was going to be called Get to Work, the Get to Work podcast. And when I shared it with a friend, she's like, that name's horrible. Um, I think there is a Get to Work podcast out there now, but um, she, she's like, you should talk to our friend who's good at naming things. Uh, and at the time she, she at the time had stage four pancreatic cancer. And my friend was like, she needs something to think about. Please send her a list of names. And so my friend who passed away from stage four pancreatic cancer actually gave me the name getting work to work. Wow. So I, gets yeah, to I mean, live on. Yeah. Her memory gets to live on through the name. It was a long process for me coming up with author view. I remember when rounds and rounds of conversation with people thought, We'll reach out to them. What would respond sound well on their ears? One point called writer review, and I, I kind of riffed on that in different ways till I eventually arrived at author view. So it's a long process, and something I would definitely recommend giving a lot of thought to what it's going to be because you're going to build your whole. I mean, like I, you, your branding and your like you're doing for your pieces around that title. It's it's important. Well, I mean, a, another thing to consider, like I came up with a name for my second podcast, Beyond Your Imagination, and the month before I launched the show, someone else launched a podcast called Beyond Your Imagination. I was pissed. So what did I do? <laughs> I bought a domain that was like BYI uh, dot show. So if I had to change the name, I could find any word that starts with B, Y, or I, and I could change the name of the show that way. And then I just added with Chris Martin to the name, not out of ego, but just out of like- To differentiate you know, yourself. Someone yeah. else scoop me. The one thing, so I mean, when I was starting out, I wasn't really sure how to, um, you have right now, I think you said you have a plugin for your podcast right into the website and that's called Blueberry? Correct. So you talk about, yeah. On the publishing side, I use a tool called, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I use a tool called WordPress. And with WordPress, you can get a plugin called PowerPress. And what it allows you to do is connect the MP3 file to the post. And then PowerPress creates all of the connections, like all of the RSS files, all the technical things that you then submit to Apple. And so I then host my audio files with Blueberry. So I pay $40 a month for 500 megabytes of data uh, in terms of storage. And uh, that actually, I've only gone over 500 megabytes once. I'm within the range of like 450 megabytes a month of data. So what I did is I not 
I wish kind of now would have had a plugin from the WordPress kind of med site, but I was just using this to experiment and play with. So I started out with a, the podcast provider. I went with um, uh, Buzzsprout. That's what I use now. And that's a really easy place where you can put a little quick little um, description of what your show is going to be, what the title of it's going to be. And what's nice about it is that have a whole directory where you can allow yourself to list that show at multiple different places without doing any kind of additional work to make that happen. So by doing that, my show is listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, um, yeah, I heard radio, Amazon. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. It's a really easy process to do. It didn't take me a whole lot of time. The only, and then I only paid $12 a month to have that. Yeah. And then you have a, I think there's a limit to how much, how many, how much you can upload within the month. I think right now, so I've accumulated, I think three hours of content I can upload within this cycle. And then within nine days, I'll have more time added to that. You can pay more to get more time for that as well. But right now, I'm not sure how frequent I'll have episodes going up. So this is just a nice, yeah, you know, nominal spot to be in, I think, for just playing it out. And then Anch would, Anchor is a great place to start as well. Anchor is really good too. Spotify bottom. I mean, the tool is is fantastic. And I'm actually probably going to move the Beyond Your Imagination podcast to Anchor just to explore and try things out. Um, because I don't want to spend the twenty dollars a month for that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Holly asks. As a guest on a podcast, how much influence or control does one typically have on the question and direction of the interview? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to say not a whole, I mean, the one thing I will say, which I do, I don't ever want my guests to be that uncomfortable with what I ask about. So usually I will try to, if I have my questions ahead of time, I'll give it to them. So I'm like, here's what we're going to talk about. If you want to go in a different direction, if there's something you don't want to talk about, or you thought that I should bring up that I don't have here let me know so we can do that so i do think there is there is some influence there but then it, i think it ultimately does come down to the person running the podcast or interview who was really in charge of it you got the ship you're responsible for the overall outcome of it chris would you agree with that i, I would agree with that and i think there is once your show's established they kind of know the level at which you're going to talk about I, I talked to a woman one time who had just gone through a divorce and she, and she's, she said to me before we started, I will talk about anything about that divorce that you want to talk about because it was related to her creative career. Uh, and, and so she went there, we both went there and it was hard. It was, there was just a level of vulnerability that was a challenge but I'm not going to do that with everyone. Some people just want to talk about their book. They don't want to talk about what it took to write the book. They just want to like, well, in the book, I do this. And so you like test the waters a little bit. Like, well, you know, like, were you, were you anxious to, to write a book on this subject? Were you worried that it was going to get scooped by someone else? And then they'll be like, no, not at all. Okay, next question. And you make a joke out of it and you move on and recognize that it's just, you're going to skip on the surface. But then you just, you kind of develop a sense too for how much you can push someone. And, and you just kind of be like, oh, I'm going to go there. I'm going to see what happens. I, I interviewed an author recently because she wrote a story about a secret sibling. And I had just found out that I had a secret sibling. And so we actually had a really good conversation about this fictional world and then my real world. And it, and it was healing for me as the interviewer to be able to go there. I actually had this experience recently. So I think if Rachel Anderson, if she's out there, um, she's a public, she reached out and I had interviewed an author. She suggested I talk to um, Carol Dines in her short story collection, This Distance We Call Love. And I, I think, I don't think I gave her the questions ahead of time. I think I was still putting it together the day of. But like you're saying, I picked up from the flow of the conversation. She was very easygoing and very open to the conversations and the subjects of her book. And a lot of it deal with actually with relationships and, and sex is a big part of it. So I rolled into made a joke out of it, but it still, it worked very well. And I think it was one of the, one of the better interviews. I've one of the best interviews I've had maybe this year. So because of that, I mean, if you're open to do that, I think that's when you get the best that's it's most enjoyable for me at least is when you go to those points and really kind of look under the hood of what really motivates you and people well the interesting thing too is like i'll i'll send the questions ahead of time 
And every once in a while, I'll hear the crinkle of the paper because they've literally printed out the questions and wrote their answers. And I can hear them crinkling the paper and reading. And so I know to get off the question as fast as possible. And so you can actually hear the prepared statement into improv. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's just something I've learned to kind of tune my ear for. Mm. You had that quite a, I mean, I've had this one time, I had an author where I gave the, it's almost why I don't like to give questions because I've had a few times now where authors have like written the responses and read them for a band for what they wrote. And I didn't, <laughs> and you, you can tell, you can yeah. definitely see that. And, they have, and that's where I do not like that at all. And mm -hmm. I don't want to say I almost punish them for this, but then I'll come up with different questions outside of it to see what they'll say, because it, I, I, as nines member, I would not like that at all. I mean, that's not what we're here here. I'm here for a conversation. So and people definitely pick up on that. And that, that's why I have that kickoff question to where I can then break the chain of questions that I sent them or the order of questions and just be like, I'm jumping to this one right here. And yep. so then they know that I'm listening, that I'm attuned to what they're saying. And these are the general points that we're going to hit. But guess what? We're not following that structure. The one thing, okay, so uh, I've, I've touched on it a few times. So one thing that you have, when you do eventually, if you build a podcast, you'll have to have some assets or some pieces of music going into it or some, some audio files uh, if you want to have an intro. So what I used for that was Audio Jungle. That's a great place where you can buy royalty-free music. So that's what I did. And you're telling me yesterday though, so you go to artlist.io. Yeah, art, A-R-T-L-I-S-T dot I-O. And it is a subscription service that allows me, I pay $200 a year and I get access to everything in the catalog and can use it for videos or podcasts. And it's commercially licensed, which means I don't have to pay any extra fees to li license it for TV or radio. It's, it's good to go for whatever I want to use it for. And so since I produce videos and podcasts, like it's, it pays for itself after the first two months. I don't think we really talked about equipment at all. So um, <laughs> you and I are both very fortunate about this. So you said, you told me before your equipment, you borrowed from a friend, I think, and you still <laughs> have never given it back to him. I haven't, no. So <laughs> he was the one that had the podcast before and he just had it sitting in his garage. And he's like, ah, oh, come on over. I'll let you borrow it. You know, I haven't given it back. And it's, it's, um, it, it's an audio input box that you can't even buy anymore because it's so outdated. And so what I mean by that is, is I'm using a professional mic that has what's called an XLR cable. And the XLR cable comes out of the mic into this input box and it converts the signal to a USB uh, input device. There, the USB mics that you can buy today are amazing. Like there's Audio-Technica mics, there's Rode makes some great podcasting mics. Uh, and if anyone wants insight into an equipment list, feel free to reach out after the fact and I can, I can share on a deeper level what you, what you might want or need. Uh, if I were to buy today based upon my needs and, and where I would want, I would spend about $200 on a mic. Uh, I would probably get a, a, a mic by the brand Shure, S-H-U-R-E. I wouldn't buy the $400 SM7B, which is the, you know, you'll see it on every podcaster who wants to show that there's someone. <laughs> um, you know, I'd probably spend, you know, about 200 bucks on a good mic, get an audio input box. Um, and if I didn't want to do that, I would just get the USB mic. Yeah, so I know what I did, I was lucky. My boss was, he bought a, I think it was a $200 mic from, AKG and it's also a directional mic. So it means that the sound is just focused in from one direction. I can't talk all around it, but so he was using it for, I think he wanted to do it for audio books and he did one for his book and then he realized how much work went into it. So he hasn't done it since then. So I hijacked that and I'm using that now and it's connected to a preamp. And with that, I just have it connected to my computer. So it's a very simple, easy process. And also a very, I can break down. I have this stand right here, which I brought from my office and brought down here to my, to my home. So yeah, very I, easy to break down into. 
these are good tools as well. So uh, Zoom makes these handy recorders, as they're called. And uh, you can just record them on the unit. It records on an SD card and you can bring them into your computer that way. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I have this for different uh, mobile setups. And then I actually have a, like a mixer too that allows me to record up to eight people. Yeah, that's, uh, I've never played around with it. I know at the studio we have a mixer that I use, but I've never had more than three people at a time to really justify probably doing something for myself to do it at home. Could we get by with just a good mic? I think so. Yeah, you can spend about $100 on a good USB mic. Uh, at that point, you would just want like a USB input and those are pretty decent. Yeah. The, 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 don't buy a Yeti though. I'm not a huge fan of those. Um, th those look like those cylindrical half dome things. They look wildly inappropriate. Um, and they just, I just think they sound horrible. But yeah. that's just my own opinion. And so a little bit about the marketing piece here. So you have Curiosity Lab. That's where you have collaborators and different creative types to come together on different projects. And then you also have um, your, your newsletter called Curiosity Lab. Does that include notes from the interviews you have with people? Or what is that really like? I didn't look closely at it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so Curiosity Lab is just what I call my weekly newsletter that has links to the this week's episodes. And I'll share an essay that that kind of what I'm working through in a short form, maybe some links that I'm, of books that I'm enjoying. It just kind of depends on what I'm feeling each week. So uh, this week, for example, uh, I have like this quote from a book called Do It Anyway by an author named Courtney E. Martin. And it's about the next generation of activists. And I really love this quote and I'm gonna build a, the newsletter around that. Okay, that's I like that. That's a really neat way to do it. That's good. Um, I have nothing, I haven't done anything like that, but the one thing I do want to share with everyone, and I just discovered recently, and there is called Audrey.io. It's a way for you, if you want to have, you have a podcast, and you're trying to find ways to have conversations with the people, a good place to do it is with other people who want to do a podcast. So with that, I joined the service and then someone reached out to me. She is an author out of Greece and she has a bunch of works on science fiction and fantasy. And so the way it works is there's, there's an exchange. So she, I haven't listened to it yet, but for her show on the yesterday, she uploaded, she had me listed as a sponsor and I gave her some, a, a script to go over to say notes about myself and what I'm doing, what the show is. And she talked about that and did that for the intro and the outro piece. And then in return, then what I'm going to do is interview her on the 19th of this month. So that way cross collaborate, you can help promote each other. And you also have content in the process for your podcast. So everyone wins that way. This is the first time I've done it. So I'm not sure how much, how useful will be beyond that. But I think this is kind of a neat service. And so far, it looks promising. So there's a lot of stuff popping up like this, I know, out there as well. Do you share the full transcript of your episodes? Sounds like you don't, Chris. I didn't on Getting Work to Work, but it is something that I explored on the new podcast, mainly because it's, it's, it requires a financial investment or a time investment to make sure that the transcript is correct. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it was something to where I tried to incorporate it into the new process for the, the different podcasts. Um, instead of going back and trying to like transcribe 500 episodes, it just didn't make sense financially. So if it's something that you want to do, try it out and see how it fits into your creation process. Do you have a Facebook page for your podcast or what points are you sharing this? Oh, okay. No, no. It, I think at the beginning I did. Um, but at a certain point I ditched Facebook and then I just had Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. And then I ditched, I ditched Twitter and uh, Instagram. And then I started over at a certain point just because I was tired of social media. Um, I, I would often see like 40 likes on an image, but I would have maybe five listens yeah. on, on the same thing. So like people weren't going and, and listening. So just because someone liked the artwork doesn't mean that they actually listened to it. Sure. 
I know the one thing that's a new feature, I, I'm going to probably check it out tomorrow or Thursday, but I know I was going to set up a Facebook page for my podcast. And then I found out you can actually incorporate a podcast into an, a pre-existing page on, on Facebook. So I'm going to use that and integrate that with um, the Facebook page I have for my, the publishing house. So that'll be kind of a good way to, to showcase that. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I'm going to experiment and play with at some point, but have not got around to it yet. You do, uh... Kelly had a follow-up question too about monetization. Okay. So which, you, which would probably be a good one to talk about. You don't monetize your podcast, like don't sponsor anything. Uh, no, I've not. When you do the, for the Audrey.io thing, that's not monetized at all. As far as I'm aware, so far as just a different services you do for the other person. I know one option was I can go be a guest on her show, but I didn't have a lot of time available. So I couldn't really make that work. It was hard for me to do that. So it was easy for me just to come up with some, something to write and then for her to share and do on her own show. So. And no the, interesting, th the interesting thing about this, the question of monetization too, is, is when a sponsor approaches you, they want to know how many people are listening to your show. But the thing about a show is that it doesn't tell you how many people subscribe to your, to your podcast. It, they tell you how many listens you have. And right. so it's called, they want to know cost per million, but measured in thousands. So when, when an episode drops, they want to know how many thousands of people are going to listen to it immediately. Well, when you're starting out, you, you're lucky to get 40 or 100 or, you know, 1,000 over the life of an episode. So that is the challenge with, a, with really telling sponsors how many listens do you get? Yeah. I, I've had one person reach out to be a sponsor on the show. But where I've mon used the show to really monetize it in a sense is when an author or an entrepreneur or someone has a good experience, they ask, well, what do you actually do? And then I tell them about my business. And so I've actually land jobs with other people to edit their show or help them to produce their own show or just help them with video work. So it has become a marketing tool. So it is definitely like networking. Yeah, it's a marketing arm. That's yeah. that's how I set out to see it. That's how I utilize it. So yeah. I, that's what I've learned is probably the most useful. Yeah, the, the first time someone said they'll pay me like $1,000 to do work with them, like that paid for the first two years of the podcast. Like, I'm just like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely helpful. Um, um, I'm kind of at a point, I'm not sure what else to really talk about. Um, is anyone else out there have any questions for us? And feel free to jump in if you want to just talk instead of typing, if anyone has any other questions. We're not short of... Uh things to talk about. I'm curious <laughs> what the biggest time suck is um, doing a podcast. And that's one of my hesitancies is when I've done these videos, the editing, and I'm not an editor. And if editing is it, would you, either of you guys have ideas of who to hire and how much would that cost to hire an editor to do the editing piece? Chris, go ahead. So it depends on your technical ability. So for some people, their time suck might be in the actual recording of something. Maybe they're not comfortable enough on the microphone or they're nervous about interviewing someone and they're technically great at, at doing all the editing. But then there's some people that are just like, they're, they rock the mic, but they hate technology. And so when you're finding an editor you're going to see a range based upon how much time the episode is. And you're going to see a lot of different packages. You're going to see things like, well, what's the frequency of the show? Is it bi-monthly? Is it semi-monthly? Is it weekly, daily? And so you start to, we'll start to see more episodic pricing based upon you know, the episode, not per month or per package. So when I'm working with someone, uh, I'll just, I'll literally say, 
you know, a weekly show around 20 minutes an episode is $500. Um, sometimes it's 300, sometimes it's 750. It just kind of depends on what is the amount of time to edit because interviews are the time suck in editing interviews. I found for myself, if there's two guests, it's a one to two ratio. If it's an hour long, it's going to take me about two hours. If it's three guests, it's one to three, meaning one hour, or three hours. And then just my level of commitment and care for that episode. If it's for a client, I'm going to edit it a little bit more attentively than my own because, you know, they're paying me. I know for me, recording is not much of an issue to find the content, to do the conversation is not a lot of work, but the editing for me, because I get become a bit of a perfectionist and I want to be as good. I've loosened that hold on that, but editing is probably the most work. And especially for me starting out where I didn't really know the ropes, I was teaching myself how to do it. And with a lot of video tutorials and reading different guides online, once I had the hang of it, then it was fine. But I would say that if you're starting out, that would be probably the biggest crunch to do that. The one thing though, I found though, if the interview doesn't go well, what does take quite a bit. And Chris, I'd be curious your thoughts on this too, is I've had interviews go really bad, not because the person's bad, but I've had issues with audio quality or some just something came up or some distractions in the midst of the interview. I've had um, a call drop automatically out of nowhere. I had to reschedule and we were both like in the middle of like a lunch break. So we had to do it later in the day. And then it's been a lot of time. You're trying to find ways to schedule around what you're doing and your activities and I had an issue with Klecko. I this is local poet. We did an interview last Tuesday in studio, but then there was a weird sound effect. I didn't realize until after the matter was an echo and it sounded terrible. And I had to re find a way time to work with him and to me to do it. So we did um, Friday in the evening time. And it worked out. It ended up being a, usually what I found though, those interviews end up being better than the first time. So it's in the long run, I think, okay, it's not, I'm not too frustrated by that, but that's been a crunch if it doesn't work out when it's when it's fine and it's consistent and you can schedule and work everything out ahead of time it's not much of an issue but when things go south and trying to work that out again that's when it takes most time but editing overall i'd say is probably the biggest time okay time crunch thank my, you my uh, favorite my favorite <laughs> moment was when i had to do an interview three times the first time was kind of like the pre-run the second time we were recording locally on each computer. And when we got to the end of the interview, one of the people said, oh no, it didn't record. And I didn't have a backup at the time. So you, much to my surprise, I learned a lot about recording audio on my end when it's on other people's systems as well, so. Uh, question. Yeah, let's see, unmute. You're unmuted. You're on off. Yeah, we can hear you, Alfred. Okay, a couple of things. Um, would you re recommend for a uh, an aspiring novelist if he or she could join Toastmasters, Toastmasters to build up their speaking ability for in interview interviews and shows uh, that's one thing and this is the second thing is that editing these days is so costly uh can can the author learn to self edit and how would he or she do that thank you yeah great questions uh Absolutely, 100% learning how to edit yourself if you're technically inclined is doable by watching YouTube videos. There is a, I mean, just go to YouTube and type Adobe Audition and you'll find hours upon hours of information to learn. Descript.com is a great tool for just editing the audio transcripts and they most likely have support that you can talk with and, and training videos as well. And I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of the question. Oh, um, Toastmasters. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people are shy, <laughs> like me, or have problems speaking 
publicly. Uh, I think if I or, or another person would join Toastmasters, that would help about a great deal in taking interviews. I, I would 100% agree with you. Toastmasters is a great place to start um, if you are shy or just want to learn how to speak, uh, prepare speeches. My wife did Toastmasters through her work years ago, and she, she met some fun people. She had a good time doing it, and she really got more comfortable with public speaking. So it is definitely a great resource, and there's probably chapters everywhere. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great questions. Well, thank you so much, Chris and Joshua. I think this was an awesome discussion tonight. Does anybody else have any other questions before we say goodnight? One, one thing I'll just kind of share as we wrap up, if anyone wants um, a free workbook to kind of develop your podcast, I have a workbook called Develop Your Podcast. And it's something that um, if you want it, I just send me an email, chris at chrismartinstudios.com, and I will gladly send it to you. It's something that I've used with several people to develop their show, and it walks you through the entire process from start to launch. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. Uh, can I ask an, another thing? Yeah. One more question, Alfred. <laughs> Uh-oh, but I think you oh, muted oh. yourself. We lost you, Alfred. I'm sorry. Okay, then there we go. Um, but this is a great uh, occupation and a great career. But I think a lot of people get discouraged. What do you do when you have feelings of depression or discouragement? I can't do this. I shouldn't have tried it, et cetera, et cetera. Welcome to Monday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Do you have another hour? <laughs> I was thinking what a horribly dark question to end on in the, late, in the next 30 uh, seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> you know what? There's, there's going to be moments where there's doubt. Um, but I think looking at the track record, like if I feel like a, a fraud or like I'm a hack, I just need to look at the last five and a half years and be like, I've done it. I can do it. So look for the evidence, look for the proof, look for the people that are emailing you. Look for the people that are sharing your content. Um, look to the emails that you know your friends are sending you. There's evidence out there of your impact on people if you're willing to look for it. And so I would say just find it and hold on to it, screenshot it, save it, make a, a tear file of all of the nice things people have said about you so that you can smooth, um, smooth your your tattered ego and and torn soul and and you feel better about life 